Dan just introduced me, so that goes to the first slide. <laughs> but really, uh, my name is Denise Scammon. I'm a 2012 graduate of the Arts and Humanities program here at Lewiston Auburn College. I pursued my degree while I was working full time, and it was difficult at times. And what I like to say is that I had to give a few things up at home, and I really missed cooking and cleaning for five years. <laughs> Um, while I talk, I'm going to pass out some examples of the work I've done, and you'll understand why I'm passing out these particular examples and how they relate to my work in the arts and humanities. And those items that I want back are just the two magazines and then my Bible, which is the AP Style Book. And the reason I chose that is I just want you to know how difficult it is to go through college and have to write your research papers either in the MLA style or the APA style, but yet at work you use the AP style. And sometimes I had to ask for forgiveness because uh, you know, it's just kind of difficult to keep those all straight. So first I thought we would define the humanities. Um, does anybody here have a ready definition? No? Okay. So I really like this definition from Stanford um, University. Basically what it says is that uh, the humanities tap into the human experience on many levels and in many areas. And also, from this poster comes this quote, the humanities are about what it is to be human. So whatever the humanities mean to you, it's important to put them in context to see how we are affected by them every day. You've read about the budget cuts taking place at USM, and particularly the Arts and Humanities program was cut from Lewis and Auburn College. Um, so you're probably wondering why I would be promoting the humanities. Well, fortunately, the humanities courses are still being offered at Lewis and Auburn College, and I feel very strongly that those courses are some of the um, most engaging it's an eclectic mix of topics, and um, I just find that they are, um, they were my favorite courses, obviously, but they had a lot to do with writing. I did hear some students from other majors complain about all the writing, but I enjoyed it. So this, um, this cartoon character, her name's Libby, and there, I found her on Twitter one day, she says, you know, what she loves most about the humanities and their importance to society. And again, I think that um, humanities, the study of humanities, helps one become a better communicator. And you can follow her on Twitter if you want at Smart Colleges. Now, I thought I'd throw in a little bit of humanities humor to help you understand a little bit more the difference between the humanities and science. Now, can you see a science professor that you know at the top going, yay, I call that Tyrannosaurus Rex. Is like Professor Stasco popping to his head. Is he here? No. <laughs> okay. Tell him I mentioned him. And then at the bottom you have the humanities saying, well, it might not be such a good idea. So now that we know the definition of the humanities, I'll tell you how I use um, my studies. Well, first of all, I am a Sun Journal editor in two different departments. I'm a writer for Lewis and Auburn College. At the Women's Literary Union, uh, my favorite position is being historian. And actually, just Saturday, I gave a presentation. Some of you were at it. Um, presentation on the history of the Women's Literary Union and their beautiful clubhouse, the Fox Mansion. 
and I brought a few of those slides here today. Um, I'm also on the USM Alumni Board, and most recently I acted as a mentor to a wonderful uh, Lewis and Auburn College student. And, and then again, recently I was appointed to the LA Arts Board where I will be helping them with their marketing and audience engagement. And I see an LA Arts member in the back. I do. So again, I'm just going to repeat that communications is at the core of the human experience and is a large part of the humanities studies. And these are some of the areas that I have put my arts and humanities learning to use. So again, if you um, have to take some electives for any of your majors here at LAC, I would highly recommend taking humanities courses. They're usually fascinating um, topics. This is some of the work that I've done at the Sun Journal as a special sections editor. Um, the copies that I have by the door, you're welcome to take. The, I chose the college bound because there's a page in each one of the five issues that I brought that has a student or an LAC faculty member profiled. And um, so as an editor, what I do is I come up with story ideas. I hire freelancers uh, who write or take photos. And because my budget only allows for a certain number of stories per section, the rest of the stories I curate from subscription services. And then, of course, I edit and format those photos and stories and get them in the um, computer so that we can design pages. So sometimes I have the opportunity to write and I interview people from all walks of life. Um, I take photos. Sometimes I get to design the pages that go in the special sections. And then as Dan mentioned, I am the Encore editor. And some of you probably are aware that many businesses are doing, um, cutting their budgets. So it's happening right here at LAC. So sometimes when someone retires or, um, or their position is cut, they're not replaced. Their work instead gets divided up among other employees, which is why I am both the special sections editor and one of the entertainment editors. And um, I chose these two examples because, um, Robin, your um, Secrets of the Sea, which is still on display downstairs, was published thanks to a wonderful press release you sent in. So speaking of press releases, it's one of my peeves because I see so many pep, uh, press releases. I handle all of them that come in for the Encore. So this is just an, a made-up example, but it's very typical of some of the press releases I get. Um, I have no idea who sent this press release in. Looking at the email address, I cannot tell who sent this in um, because it was joeblow at hotmail.com. So um, I can't even tell what company it was. And again, people like to use a lot of exclamation points. I don't print those. <laughs> um, so on the back of this, there's some of these by the door. On the back of this, it tells you how to write a press release in case anybody knows someone who might need that guidance. And um, no one's here from the Sun Journal, but when I told them that I was coming here, and I told them I was talking about the press releases, they said, yay! <laughs> so now I'm going to move on to my work at Lewis and Auburn College. Um, first of all, I don't know if you, probably you all know that Lewis and uh, Auburn College provides undergraduate and graduate degrees through an interdisciplinary curriculum. And that's the key uh, point. The interdisciplinary curriculum sets the university off from other schools. Uh, I've been working for Dan Philbrick on special projects um, for Dean Joyce Gibson for about four years. And um, I've worked on the 25th anniversary timeline, which is on the wall downstairs. 
and we also put together a 25th anniversary commemorative booklet. And so I've interviewed and written faculty, student, and alumni profiles. And is there anybody in the room here who I've interviewed? No. Wow. Well, <laughs> they've been um, published in various publications, including Loose and Auburn Magazine and online and in some of the Sun Journal publications. So now I'm going to move on to the Women's Literary Union. And the reason I'm bringing all these different um, organizations and my work to focus is because um, the point of my presentation is how I use my arts and humanities degree. Sadly, it's not being offered, but you can take humanities courses. I've been a member of the Women's Literary Union since 2010. I've done fundraising, friend raising. I've acted as a, uh, the webmaster, a blogger, historian, publicist, marketing, and bunko hostess. Um, I want to point out why the Women's Literary Union has an A in, the, in its name for woman. It's because the uh, organization was established in 1892, and that was in the age of the new woman, spelt with an A. And so that just signifies that these women were progressive. It was in the age when women were just starting to leave their familiar domestic sphere. Um, some of the early activities of the Women's Literary Union um, in 1898, you've probably heard me say um, the Women's Literary Union promoted adding kindergarten to the public schools in Lewiston Auburn. Prior to that, there was there, kindergarten didn't exist. And then in um, 1905, the WLU members held a roundtable with educators to discuss adding domestic science and manual training to the public schools. Now, domestic science and manual training are still offered in schools, but they have different names. They might be called home economics or industrial arts, but they're still offered. Probably something different is probably um, both the boys and girls can take those classes, whereas back in 1905, it would have been the girls taking domestic science and the boys taking the manual training. Um, in 1907, WLU established the first three playgrounds in Lewiston Auburn. And they did such a good job establishing those playgrounds that both Lewiston and Auburn allowed the Women's Literary Union to manage those playgrounds for over 20 years until they created their own recreation departments. In the meantime, the cities paid um, or gave Women's Literary Union, each city gave $200 so that the Women's Literary Union could hire teachers to run the playgrounds. But the Women's Literary Union was in charge of the whole thing, hiring them, getting the equipment, uh, raising money for the equipment that went up above the $200. So those are just a few of the, um, the activities that the Women's Literary Union has in their history. Now something more recent is um, over the last 10 years, and I'm not quite sure, how many years have we been doing that mother-daughter doll team? Maybe 14? Yeah. So at least 10 years. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the mother-doll team, but it's held every April or in the spring. And it allows young girls and boys to to attend a social gathering where they can observe proper behavior, etiquette, how to dress, and have a good time with, um, with adults. And another new um, program at the Women's Literary Union is the Prom Gown Giveaway. Now what we do with the Prom Gown Giveaway is we ask the public to donate unused clean prom gowns that we then give away to high school girls from anywhere. It doesn't have to be Lewiston Auburn. But we open up the beautiful Foss Mansion 
and we set it up so that it's like a salon boutique experience rather than a bargain basement free for all. And it was really great. Uh, so in the first year we did it, which was this spring, um, we gathered 255 gowns in three weeks time. So what does that tell you? It sort of sounds like the community was waiting for this event to happen. Um, and those 255 gowns were brought to drop-off locations and Lewis and Auburn College graciously offered to um, have this as one of the drop-off locations. And Dan, you said that it was fun having these people drop off. Yeah, it was. So, um, it, so people dropped off gowns at um, Lewis and Auburn College, at the Sun Journal where I work, and also at the Women's Literary Union by appointment. So when we held the event, 65 girls attended, which is a really good amount, figuring it was our first year. And plus, I had read that the um, Maine, Maine Cinderella Project, which is statewide, their first year, they had 13 girls attend. So 65 girls, I was happy with that. Now out of those 65 girls, 55 girls found the gown of their dreams. And they let us know how happy they were. A lot of them, um, and, I, and I mean this sincerely, a lot of them said that they felt like a princess, not only in the gown, but in the, um, the beautiful Foss Mansion. So um, we, I got this information from surveys we had the girls fill out. Nine girls out of those 65 had ever heard of the Women's Literary Union before. And out of the 65 girls, only two had ever been in the Foss Mansion before. So I feel that the event was a success in many ways. You know, it, it was for a good cause. It helped those girls get gowns. And um, it brought some publicity to the Women's Literary Union. Now, one other thing we do that is like a friend raiser, fundraiser, is we play bunko. Now, has anybody here played bunko before? Okay. <laughs> I know some of you have. Um, well, we've been playing it for a few years now, and each time we play it, we, we might raise about $200. Um, men are allowed to go. You don't lose your man card for attending, someone asked. <laughs> Men can go, and it's just a fun dice game. Um, it was you have partners. It's actually a really good way to break the ice with people, or to um, let um, people, employees, meet other employees who they might not see each other, but they might just be sending emails. So if you have a bunko event, you're constantly moving and switching partners all night long. So it's a good um, way to break the ice. So now I'm going to talk about that beautiful Foss Mansion I was talking about. Now this photo right here shows um, the house that was at 19 Elm Street that the Fosses tore down to build that beautiful mansion we saw a picture of. Um, now, 1960s local historian noted that there was a Native American burial ground where the Foss Mansion was built. So wherever there's a Native American burial ground, there would have been a well-established um, village nearby, a Native American village. And there was. There was the um, an, an Cook tribe that was established on Laurel Hill, or Laurel Avenue in Auburn. And um, there was a huge massacre in 1690 with the English settlers versus the um, in a Sagantikuk tribe, which is an Abenaki tribe. Um, so this is what the house, when the house was torn down, this is the house that the Fosses built. So the reason I told you about the Native American burial ground is because when the Fosses were building this house, they unearthed three skeletons in 1915 when they were excavating around the original foundation. And at the time, it was believed that they were Native Americans. So whatever they found in the um, graves with the skeletons made them believe that it was Native Americans. Now, I've read that some Native Americans are buried sitting up, and they're buried with their wampum and their beads. And um, 
so maybe that was the case. I don't know, but I did read a 1915 newspaper article that invited anyone with a camera to go up to the house because the bones had been placed in a box on the porch and people were invited to come up and take pictures and the article used terms like um, the red man, uh, wouldn't the red man's face have blanched as white as the white man, you know, upon coming face to face and, um, and they called them savages. So, you know, big difference in times, but um, so there was a native Indian burial ground there, but the city of Auburn used to be called Bakerstown and its boundaries were different. And one street away from the Women's Literary Union, so from Spring Street down to the railroad tracks on Minot Avenue, Bakerstown slash Auburn um, used that as their city cemetery. And that's where Edward Little was originally buried. And in 1865, the city stopped using it as a cemetery, and the graves were dug up and moved. And that's when um, Edward Little's family plot was moved to Oak Hill. But you can only move um, plots who have gravestones, markers on them. So, you know, what are the chances that um, some of the skeletons that have been found at the Foss Mansion, they could have been from the city cemetery, they could have been from the Native American burial ground. But two more skeletons were discovered on the Foss Mansion property in the 1990s. And so when those two were discovered, the police were called and they came and looked at the bones and they saw that they were very old and there weren't any missing persons. So they shipped the bones off to the state medical examiner in Augusta and he said it was too expensive to do DNA, the police weren't interested, and so the article said that, um, the state medical examiner said that he would have them properly buried. So what became of them, I don't know. So we're gonna just um, take a quick peek inside the Foss Mansion so you can see um, what a beauty it is and uh, what an important resource it is to the community. Um, it's a Georgian Revival house and if you know anything about um, architecture, Georgian Revival means that it's a balanced house. It has a central hall. That's typical. Um, it has a flying staircase. Now, the, it gives its name because the um, the upper stairs appear to be flying. They appear to not have any support. And I want to point out while I'm on this slide that um, the Women's Literary Union is going to be having an open house in December. They're going to have the house all decorated for the holidays. They have um, a couple of businesses coming in. I know last year they had orphan annies come in and decorate. And again, they're going to be doing the same thing. So if you have a chance to attend this open house. It's December 13th and 14th, which is a Saturday and Sunday. And uh, I think you'll, you'll find that the house is even more beautiful in person. The woodwork in the house is just incredible. And the dining room, um, the owners didn't spare any money um, on the latest technological innovations. So here they had the recessed lighting, which is unusual. Um, the research room upstairs, this used to be just a room to bring all your, you know, whatever you weren't using in the rest of the house got dumped in this room. And when I was a student, I was invited um, to, for a tour of the Women's Literary Union and someone opened up a closet and she said, we don't even know what's in this closet. And it was just full of scrapbooks dating back to the 1890s. And so immediately I asked um, my professor if I could do an independent study and that's when I wrote the grant that, um, that we got that allowed us to hire a professional preservationist to help us preserve all these um, important historical documents and Bates College threw in um, 
seven, uh, 35 of those archival boxes. And Robin, you probably know this, but I just think it's this little neat little piece of trivia, but these archival boxes aligned with something that's just like Pepto-Bismol, because it helps break down the acid, I guess. Is that right? That's so. Something like that. <laughs> I think it's like buffered, uh, buffered surface. Yeah. And so back to the um, these innovations that they had. That house, built between 1914 and 1917, has a central vacuum system. And this is the motor that's in the uh, basement. And it's pretty amazing. So there are outlets in the baseboard uh, throughout the house, first, second, and third floor. Um, and the actually, the hose is still available. We just haven't. Um, turned it on. I don't know anybody that's turned on the motor to see if it still works. <laughs> what was that? She called me chicken for not turning the motor on. She's right. <laughs> so, you know, as an arts and humanities student, I, I love all the history that's um, at the Women's Literary Union in the house. Um, so putting that vacuum system into context Here's this advertisement for that same vacuum cleaner, and it says, why make a janitor out of your wife <laughs> and force her to put up with the back-breaking labor of beating, sweeping, and dusting? So I just thought that was a, a really neat little piece of trivia there. And so the owners of the house um, were Horatio and Ella Foss. Ella Foss bequeathed the house to the Women's Literary Union in 1941. Uh, she was a member, but she wasn't highly active in the group. She was just a philanthropist, and the Women's Literary Union actually had bought their first clubhouse uh, on Main Street, the former Edward Little House. So they were located right around the corner from her. Um, she did host some events at her house, for the Women's Literary Union before she passed, including um, an open house where 250 people walked through between 10 and 2, and um, she had a fortune teller there, and just interesting little things. Uh, Horatio made his money in the shoe industry and in investments. He divided his time between Auburn and Boston, and he invested his money in a schooner called the um, H.G. Foss, and I just happened to come across a children's newspaper, and there was a whole story about the H.G. Foss sinking and how the crew survived, and it was um, just, uh, it was really neat. The ship did sink. It sunk about 400 miles off the coast of Bermuda. Um, Ella's estate was worth $1.6 million when she died, which would be $24 million in today's currency. Now, Horatio, even though he was well-respected in the community and he was a great philanthropist, he was also being sued. Um, so he was being sued by a woman, you can't make this up, a woman called Oda Papathanos. And she was suing him for assault. Now, the newspapers called him Mr. Blank. Eventually, his identity was revealed. But before his identity was revealed, there was someone else in the community who was under suspicion because everyone was protecting Horatio. So when his identity was finally revealed, the newspaper article said that now the man in the lumber industry can rest easy because he's not under suspicion. So, um, yeah, this was a story that um, went on for years and years and years. And we had the opportunity to talk to some of Ella's relatives. And they said that when Horatio died, Ella destroyed every photo that she had of him. So we don't have any photos of him. This came from a microfilm, his obituary. And speaking of his obituary, um, it was a newspaper article about his death, and it said he suffered a shock at lunch. 
And of course, they used different language back then, but I don't know, I just picture Oda knocking on the door. He was having lunch, and Ella was home. <laughs> so, you just don't know. <laughs> Um, Horatio was very interested in cars. He owned two identical touring cars at the same time. When his garage was built, it was built as a garage and not a carriage house because he had already given up his horses. Um, his garage was built with a turntable in the floor so he could just drive in and they could spin it around and he wouldn't have to put the car in reverse. A lot of the early cars either didn't have reverse or the reverse gear didn't work very well. So um, he was fortunate to have that turntable. Um, Horatio entered his cars in a race that was held by the city of Auburn on Court Street. The city of Auburn actually shut down Court Street for a couple hours, two days in a row, and businesses left their employees out to witness these car races. It was such a big deal in uh, the early 1900s. And um, so Horatio entered his cars in this, these races. Now on the first day, there were 1,000 people who attended. And then on the second day, there were 2,000 people who attended. And um, that's because they were having the hill climbing contest. The cars were actually going up Goff Hill. And it was a really big deal. <laughs> and it was such a big deal that the newspaper article actually interviewed one of the witnesses at the event. And he said, it was so windy, my hat blew off, but it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> now this um, garage also included a chauffeur's quarters, and it had a gas pump because gas stations were far and few between at that time. Um, the turntable's gone in the floor, and the gas pump's been sold. Um, the chauffeur lived across the street from Ella. Um, he took care of her driving and we think probably a little bit of the maintenance around the house. This is a picture of Ella and her brother. Uh, she was a very fashionable dresser and I don't know if any of you, uh, you must know Geneva Kirk or who she was. Well, Geneva's mother, Mary Kirk, was one of Ella's dressmakers. And we think, because we've seen a few pictures of Ella, and she's always been well-dressed, that we think that she would like that um, Women's Literary Union is using her home for the prom gown giveaway, and also that we have seamstresses there who sew incredible um, doll clothes. I don't know if you've been to our boutiques. Um, we sell incredible doll, uh, doll clothes for like the American girl size. And so now I'm going to talk about LA Arts. Now this is my newest venture, so I'm not, um, not as proficient as what to say about it, but I can say that um, it's a, an organization that um, promotes the power of the arts, and they are revitalizing downtown. Now, I don't know if, um, if any of you have ever thought of back in the day when horse carriages were the mode of transportation. You can imagine what it was like shopping downtown Lisbon Street with snowbanks and horse carriages. Well, I came across this little story. And there was a, and you can't make these stories up. They're just incredible when you read the archives from uh, the newspaper. So this woman who was married to a well-known doctor from West Auburn, was shopping on a Saturday and their streets and sidewalks were jam-packed full of people and horses and carriages. Something spooked her horse and it took off and when it took off her carriage flipped and it was an enclosed carriage and she was inside all bundled and she had all kinds of packages because she had been shopping so she wasn't hurt but um, people inside the shops could hear the commotion and so they ran out and everybody knew everybody back then and her horse's name was Dick. <laughs> so the article said that several men ran out of the journal building and got Dick to stop and that they turned her carriage upright and sent her on her way. She wasn't hurt. <laughs> so I mean, we probably won't see that again downtown. <laughs> 
So how many of you have heard of LA Arts? And do you know what LA Arts does? Okay. One of the programs it does is it promotes arts and education, which is really important. Um, arts and education is provided to the schools, and they, you know, you think of the arts, so theater, that would include um, like Shakespeare, puppets, storytelling, uh, the literary arts such as poetry or bookmaking, um, music, they do um, history through music, uh, songwriting, singing, and I bet the kids really like the African drumming. <laughs> then they do dance and um, they have sponsors and grants that help uh, with these programs. Did I miss anything, Judy? Okay. <laughs> And then this, uh, I don't know if any of you have met uh, Josh Vink. He's the executive director. And he's been working to keep this nonprofit relevant to the community. It began in 1973 as a Lewiston library program. And it's earned national recognition and awards for its um, programs and services over the years. And of course, you've all heard of the Art Walk, I hope. Good. Okay, well the Art Walk began in 2011 as a grassroots endeavor, and it's been supported by community members, but it's grown into an event spearheaded by LA Arts, and it features over 20 visual artists, um, and 20 visual art galleries, exhibits, and special performances. I'm hoping this year, uh, coming up, I've talked to Judy about it, that they add something like readers, um, reader's table. So does anybody here know if the senior college still does that? You know, where it's a theater group? They do that. Yeah. Reader theater. They were just an article in Twin yeah, City Times this week. Yeah. Front page, Twin okay. City Times. Yeah. I just think it's such a portable entertainment that um, it, it would be something that would be uh, perfect for L.E. Art Walk. And here's a picture. I don't know if any of you have attended the Art Walk and seen the artists actually creating art in some of the empty storefronts. And they have um, live music also. And then they also have something um, called Dinner in White. And I don't know if anybody's attended that. It's when you bring a table and a white tablecloth and everything has to be white and your clothing has to be white, and your food has to be white. And um, they just set it up, and they have that in the early part of the evening right there in the um, plaza. It's a, it, the dinner on Blanc comes from a Paris mm. area originally. The gentleman who started it had been in some war or away, and he came home in his neighborhood, he had a party, and then it kept growing and growing. So then they went to a public space. You didn't know where it is. It's sort of like a surprise. The first one they held, you had a, a, like a half day notice. Normally it's hours, like the one in New York is hours. And you come, it is a great event. They did not do it last, this past summer, I think because of some conflict with uh, uh, copywriting of the name. Uh -huh. But it's a great <laughs> story uh, if you get a chance to go online and read the history. And it really is bringing friends together. Yeah. yeah, it was great. It was, yeah. um, it was so much fun. Yeah. Well, good. And then, um, in addition to scheduling bands, I've seen musicians playing solo at the Art Walk. Now, has any, did anybody attend the Ice Festival? One of our Yep. You did? Well, the, in last year, I'm glad you're here, Judy. So, in 2014, over 3,000 people attended this three-day event. Now, I wanted to know though, Judy, was that 3,000 people for the three days or was it the first two days? Oh. Because the, it says that 1,300 people attended the family day on Sunday. Correct. So I was going to be broken up from yeah. Friday and Saturday. Yeah. So that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Yeah. So and over 20... Ice sculptures and lots of flowing I don't even know that. Oh, it's my it's 
Is it? Chad Central Distributors, my daughter's family business. My daughter works there. Well, there. Well, during the event, they have places where you can get warmed up inside, as well as they have portable heaters outside. But inside one of the mills, they had over 23 local restaurants who brought samples of their food. So you paid a ticket to get into the event, but you could eat all the food you wanted to at, um, in, in the sampling area. So it was really great. And then the igloo, that was really neat. They built an igloo that you could walk inside and you know do a selfie or have a group photo. Now something new that um, LA Arts is working on is a public art sculpture. Now one sculpture is going to be located where the buildings burned down in the 2013 fires. And you're probably wondering which buildings were those. Well, they, they were torn down, so they're gone in one of the uh, side streets. And then um, another sculpture that's planned will be a bronzed Muhammad Ali outside the Colosseum. And then again, this is um, our executive director of LA Arts. Um, LA Arts is also um, spearheading an arts and culture, Lewis and Aubin, which is a group of 19 arts and cultural organizations, and they've been tasked with advocating and marketing their work to the public. So again, I just want to repeat that um, LA Arts mission is to engage and inspire a vibrant community through arts and culture. And that is it. I hope that by presenting this information to you that you have an understanding of the arts and humanities and why I feel this degree was like the perfect degree program for me. I'm very um, sad to see it go. I hope it gets reinstated sometime in the future. You know, never say never. Um, but if you do have the opportunity to um, visit the Women's Literary Union or partake in one of LA Arts, Art Walks or the Ice Festival, um, please do. I think you'll enjoy it. And that's it. Any questions? How did we go from Bakerstown to Auburn? Do you know? How did we go? There, you know, the boundaries changed at least three times that I know of because for a while, Auburn was actually in Oxford County. And it was part of Danville and Minot. And then so if you're looking for that cemetery, it might be in Oxford County's historical records. I haven't found any more than what I read in a newspaper article. Um, and so then it was part of mine in Danville, but I'm not sure if it was part of mine in Danville at the same time, or if it was part of mine at one time and Danville at another time. But I think it's had its boundaries changed uh, several times. So that would be a good question for Alan. I don't know the answer, but I remember being told the answer. It's in Interstock and Irish, a, book, a local book by John Henderson. Uh, when he did his downtown walk, it was about how Irish people were from Ireland. Yeah. So that was the first time I heard it. So it's in Interstock and Irish. Yeah. 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 Y
just to find out exactly the origins. Which is why a degree in arts and humanities is important so you have those research capabilities, right? Love it. I love it. There's just not enough time. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. Check at the Historical Society in Auburn. About um, not recently. Not within the last four years. Yeah. I have. And that's been very there. interesting. We did some research for everywhere, Jay, mm -hmm. and we went through files and files and files, and we found a lot of stuff. But there was a lot of stuff that we weren't looking for, but we found, and it was so interesting. Yeah. You know, the way. It was very. It's a lot of fun. I heard that they might have a picture of Horatio, mm -hmm. Bad Boy Horatio. Oh, that's right. So, see, hoarding is not necessarily a bad thing if you hold on to all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I have to manage it. Well. Thank, Thank you very much. Any more questions? <laughs> I, I have one. I, I'm just kind of curious if you've got any ideas of how LAC could better engage in the community for people who aren't students. I think um, the senior college is really important. And um, that's where I would start, senior college. Um, do you still do the high school engagement? Um, the high school students can take courses here if yes. they're eligible. Yep. So Free that's course. another good way. Because I think a lot of folks just don't know about this jewel we have here. And, and, and that's a shame because it's, it could be so much more in the community if the community just, And I think we need to do the outreach. It's true, it, yes, outreach and, uh, for example, at the um, chamber breakfasts. Which, we, which we've done. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah. Do the students have field trips here? Depends on the course and the curriculum of the, of the course, but I know when uh, Barry Rodriguez was teaching the Arts and Humanities program here, he would take students out, not necessarily within the community, um, but sometimes. I don't know if you... But how about how about local schools coming here? Do they have field trips anymore? Uh, they do. Um, the problem with that is a lot of their budgets have been cut, so field trips have been cut back. But one of which, and I think Robin can speak to this, uh, an upcoming event is Lewiston Middle School. Um, their art mm -hmm. teacher mm -hmm. is hosting or holding a family night here in the Atrium Gallery. And that, I believe, will be oh. all of the middle all school students, students invited. Yeah. Oh. And their families. and. Oh, And there's a nice little cafe. Walking through today, 
and I'd like more opportunities to come back. The, there is a sign. It does say additional parking, but sometimes it gets blocked depending on what vehicle's parking there. But, um, but we, we start with, it's right down here. If, if you come in the main entrance, and let's say you're coming down, and this is our thinking anyways, every spot is taken. As you turn the corner to go around, it'll be facing you to say, try to drive people to the back. Because when the new lot was built up above, we realized that this lot would most likely be forgotten or abandoned. So we were trying to drive more people out But back. if these but, were the primary entrances rather than that first one you see, this to be, that's the first. Yeah, the original entry. master plan called for the, the yeah. main entrance to be oh, up at the upper block, but of course that's all been. Because I've gone to two sections that are very nice welcoming openings today. You know, that I'm thinking, oh, I didn't really come through the front door. I must have come through a side door because they're so welcoming. There's one halfway over and then something in this section that really mm -hmm. makes you feel welcome when you walk in. Yeah. Well, when you go downstairs, I'd like to repeat that. Um, Dan, Robin, and I worked on the 25th anniversary timeline. Yeah. Yes. Any thoughts on how we could promote an interest in reviving the arts and humanities as a program? I think it's one thing to state to the general public the value of arts and humanities in the abstract, but uh, something specific. It comes down to the money and the budget. Um, you, you know, if if we were asked, if we were told that uh, there was money in the budget for either this or that, you know, it would be easy to round up a lot of people, but without the money there and the way that it was cut, um, you know, some hard cuts have to be made. And I think it'll be a while before it gets reinstated. But that was a good question. Well, I'll put in a plug for the, uh, so you had mentioned the snowshoes, mm -hmm. uh, for the Franco-American collection. Yeah. Yes, now where is that located again? Because it's moved, some, some people might have been. It's, it's in what we call our north lobby, so the north end of the yeah. building, which That's is the opposite end. And where it's right off of, used to be. Correct, right where the bookstore used to be, yeah. um, right off of Westminster Street. So they have a, uh, Great uh, facility there now. Lots more room than uh, a great exhibit uh, with um, Franco American Thanksgiving right now on the holidays. Mm -hmm. uh, it was put together by Maureen uh, Perry, who's uh, here with us today, and also our volunteer George Bluen. Um, yeah, he really deserves the credit on that one. Yeah, the, the, the Franco collection is another uh, jewel in, in the community as well. But uh, publicizing and getting the word out and, and programming all comes down to budget dollars. So um, I think we do a fairly good job with the limited resources that we have, but you know, you can only get to so many people over so many times. So on your way out also, there's some um, brochures and my business card in case you wanted to talk to me about anything or a news story. And you can take what you want from that table. I have two comments. First, um, the art walk is absolutely fabulous. Um, I've been to a couple of them. I didn't go. I, I walked through the, the last one. I think it was in August. So um, September. Was September. 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 Okay. Well, I, I was in one in. Well, I can't remember when it was, but I was going up to, to dinner um, with my niece and her fiance, who were visiting from. Philadelphia and we went to Mother India and so we were walking through the art walk and I growing up I'm a lifelong resident of Auburn I grew up in Auburn um, Lewis and Auburn we're not quite there yet but we're getting there and I thought that night this is it um, there is nothing that was going on there that didn't rival anything that the old board puts on uh, it's just a matter of changing people's perspectives um, but the, the entertainment the liveliness of Lisbon Street, um, the, the people, um, you know, I, I saw all kinds food of people choices. I knew, food choices, absolutely. Um, so if you haven't experienced it, go. Um, the second thing, the, the Foss Mansion, I had, uh, well, Lynn and I brought over the dresses that were dropped up here, so I had the um, uh, honor of having a personal tour of my niece, uh, and again, lifelong resident of Auburn, and my grandmother being a past president of the Women's Literary Union, I had never been in. 
Uh, you talk about jewels. I mean, this place, and, and everybody hears about the Victoria Mansion in Portland, blah, blah, blah. This place was fabulous. And, and I don't know if I got a better tour than other people would have got. I mean, it was a, it was a great <laughs> tour. But, you didn't bring um, over the gowns. The, the, the amount of, like, the, the, what you mentioned, the, the, the history in it, the, the architectural detail, um, there's something there for everyone. So even if you're not into architecture, that you know, there's something there in history. There, it was just the fabulous. story of so, the fossils. So, yeah, that um, everything. So those are the two things that I kind of wanted to, oh, to highlight. And last, I'd like to present uh, Denise with a little oh. token of thank you for coming in. Uh, part of the alumni lecture series that's sponsored by the, our community advisory board here. We invite um, folks like Denise to come back and talk about. Uh, how their degree has helped them or you know, what it has meant to them here. And uh, we'd like to let them go in. So I have a, a alumni sweatshirt for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.